and we are live good evening everybody thank you for joining us today um or thank you for joining us tonight we have very, we have two very special guests with us today brent carlser and keegan wasserfall i'm sure you all know um brent carlser uh ajax sundance bafana player and now currently working with players union and we have keegan wasserfall as i'm sure also a lot of people know that is a uh, football intermediary with Siavuma Sports Group. Was that, did I say that correct, Keegan? Yeah, that's spot on. So just, yeah, welcome, welcome. I don't know if you guys want to <laughs> say hello to the one person that's watching. <laughs> guys, I can, uh, I'll let you go first, yeah. Okay. Thank you for joining us. Um, I think as I was going over questions and stuff and thinking about this interview, I was thinking um, your input is really valuable, not just for players, the depth of experience that you have, that both of you have, um, is valuable for parents, for players, and a lot of the upcoming generations. So I really want to thank you for setting time aside to have this interview with me. I think we're going to go straight into it. Um, Brent, maybe for you first, I'm going to talk about your career because uh, <laughs> I want to get into currently, what's your role currently. So I think uh, everyone will know Brent Carl, sir. Um, I haven't had the pleasure of playing with him, but um, Ajax legend, Sundance legend, Bofana legend. And his role currently is with the Players' Union. I um, maybe just want to add that Brent's views, um, his views on the show, is not um, does not represent players' union views. He's here in his own capacity as Brent Carl, so but he's obviously going to share some insights with us. So Brent, um, maybe go with you first. What is what is your current role? What are you currently involved with? Uh, thanks, Johnny. Um, thanks for your, your your people watching your show. Hi, Keegan. No, I mean, um, um, my role currently, obviously, I'm the provincial coordinator for the South African Football Players Union, and um, I do coaching on the side as well. But basically, that's my job at the moment is to look after the current pros that play in the Western Cape or around the country. Obviously, when we get the opportunity to go to the other provinces as well. Right. What sorts of things? So it's, uh, it's player protection, but what uh, when you say look after and support? What are, can you give us some examples? Yeah, look, we basically the union is there to defend um, the players' rights, you know, in terms of the employment contracts and things like that. So, but a uh, but a uh, labor labor union things, but it's different in our section of 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 work. You know, sport is different. Football especially is different in our country. So that is why the, the union is there for the players because the, the players can't go just to the CCMA and say, look, I've got fired. They can't do that. There's a process that they have to follow. And that obviously includes us. And then on the other hand, we also look at opportunities to, to, to help players do other things outside of football. So we've got partnerships with Standard Bank, um, Lifeline SA, and other um, corporates as well. So like Lifeline SA, is especially for current players, but also former players for to treat them, like for to help them with um, depression. The ones that are currently playing, they suffer a lot with, you know, a lot of other things. So we try and, you know, get as much help as we can for, for the current players. And we try and help former pl players as well. You know, Johnny, we also do the, the bursary fund you know, for, for current players and former players to do coaching badges or whatever they want to study. So we try and help wherever we can, but basically more to defend the players, you know, and, and those contracts that they sign. Yeah, so I was a beneficiary of um, the Players Union. They sponsored me to do my first D license. And I mean, that was mind blowing for me. Um, thank you, Players Union. <laughs> but yeah, that was mind blowing for me to have that opportunity. So that's um, really interesting. I think you, that's the first time I've heard of, I've had a conversation, I was at Stellenbosch this week and I was telling them that um, my first seven years of playing football, I just didn't enjoy, but I didn't know why I wasn't enjoying it. And to a certain extent, I think I was depressed. 
And that's not an easy thing to overcome because it, it, it affects every part of your game on it affects your game on the field and off the field. So yeah. that's big up to you for doing stuff like that. And I do think sport law is very different. And a lot of people don't understand that you it is, especially in our country, also there's just a different is there a different um like wing or sect? Sect is maybe not the word, but like a different wing of sport law is a very specialized i think so because obviously um cas which is um up in switzerland they obviously in terms of football they're the highest court you can go to and then you obviously have to start with your local associations which is maybe, maybe for amateur football it's a sapa and for us in the psl is the psl trc so everything starts there for clubs mm-hmm. obviously it's a different it's a different um court it's called the dc Mm. So the people mustn't get confused when they say the player's gone to the DC. No, it's the DRC. When a player oh. has a dispute, yeah, that's what it's called. But um, yeah, it's it's different. You know, like I said, um, people that got a nine to five, they go to the CCMA when they get retrenched or whatever. For our boys, it's it's not that easy. You know, they can maybe go, but most of the time, the CCM, CCMA don't doesn't know of them. You know, so it's it's very difficult. Can I, can I just come in there as well, maybe for a second? Um, Brent's 100% right. I mean, it's, it's, it's football world over where it's, it's, you know, each association or legal have their sort of way of, or protocols, you know, channels to follow. And yeah, it's, he's right. It's, as a player, it's uh, PSL, DRC. If you lose there, you can appeal at SAFA. Um, if you lose yeah. there, then you can go cash, but it's lengthy. It's costly. So, you do need that support of the unions. You know, it's only foreign players that can go direct to sort of your casses and bypass um, PSI and SAFA. But yeah, it's 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 alarming because there's many. I mean, you just have to look at TTM now um, and the cases there. But the protection is needed for the players, big time. Um, but anyway, yeah, sorry, sorry to cut no, in there. That's brilliant. I think that's my next question for you. I remember sitting in. I I I I own this office once, um, and it's so daunting having to. I think I'm negotiating my own contract. <laughs> Brent, I don't think Brent experienced anything like that, but um, it was so daunting um, trying to negotiate my own contract. So, what is your role, Keegan, um, in the football industry? Uh, it's funny actually because this this morning I actually had a bit of a lecture at ETA as well, sports management students and. Um, just to try and explain what we do, you know, and I, I guess it's similar to players' union. Mm. When you're managing people, more so sports people, <laughs> you don't have a fixed set of things that you do. I can't say that I only do X, Y, and Z, but I guess the ultimate, the biggest thing that we do is, you know, we, we scout players. Uh, personally, for our companies, 14, 15-year-olds, that's where we want to get in. Uh, we don't have a big book of, of, of players, as you see, and we run our company in a certain way, family, close-knit, um, and from there, we basically it's career planning. So you do your normal contract negotiations um, with a player. It's obviously the journeys are all different. And then it's the normal off the field, you know, it's um, different stages of their career. Obviously, there's going to be your taxes, your investments, you know, uh, your banking. And then obviously, help and assistance with their studies and all of that as well, you know, to, to sort of map that uh, pathway for post football and you know, I'm just busy with somebody now um, for he's coming to the end of his career and his coaching you know so how do we get in with that and you know tying him in with Middendorp for example who's one of our clients um, each player is so different you know and that's why the communication in today's world is so so important like you said on and off the field you know it's about how are they doing off the field so that they can do well on the field, you know, um, and I think I think that's that's key. You know, is, is getting people, players, to open up to you, so that you almost play that sort of role, you know. So yeah, we do, we do everything. <laughs> mm, it's hard to, and it's it's it's. it's um, I think it's great what you said. Every person has a different journey, and yeah. plus a career path for. For that specific person, have you found that as it hard? Have you had any success with it? Um, I can't say it's hard. I'm coming up for ten years now. 
in doing this, you know, and, and obviously in the beginning, it wasn't easy always, you know, but luckily for me, my partner is uh, a bit older than me. So he's obviously got more experience than me. And, and thankfully, uh, we share the same similar values. You know, and that's been important for me is, you know, we believe in the way we work. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's, it's not been difficult, but I can tell you there's great joy <laughs> in, in what you do especially when you see stuff come off for players, you know, players that maybe had nothing or come from nothing, you know, and then you're able to not only get them good deals that changes their lives, but also in a way mentor them, you know, and see them aspire to do well off the field and see them buy these houses to invest in and not worry only about cars and see them study. So it's, it's good. It's rewarding. It definitely is rewarding. I'm not saying there's not frustrating times and difficult yeah. times, you know, <coughs> fighting with clubs. Yeah. We've all been there. We we will be there, you know. But um, ultimately, I, I find it rewarding because every case is so different. Of course. And I think I like the model of, um, I don't know, I don't want to say, uh, I see you, it's, you're calling yourself a football intermediary. So I like that model yeah. of keeping it keeping it small, keeping your, your, the amount of people that you have small, because then you can offer them the best service. But I think For there's sure. so much, there's so many players out there as well. So Brent, this is maybe for you. Um, the structures that the PSL or the governing body needs to put in place is also important because I mean, um, one agent can only um, service a certain amount of people. And there's so many people, I think, and we're seeing it, I'm seeing it more and more, like x falling through the cracks. So my question for you ben, is that I know Players Union have been for a long time, for a while, trying to implement the policy of a minimum wage. And I think that has been, there's been challenges around it. I'm not sure what the challenges are, but why do you think, I th I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say what I have written down, a player's career, in South Africa, I think it's maybe the average play till about 30, unless you're really, really disciplined. So from 18 or 17 to 30, you have about 12 to 13 years. And if your wage rate or your earning potential at the first three years are low, you almost cut that down from 12 to 9. So I think it's so important to have a minimum wage um, policy implemented. But what are sort of challenges that, that has been faced or that are there to, that stopping that sort of policy from being implemented? Um, no, good good question, Johnny. Um, I don't think there's a, 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 a problem. I don't think there's a, a stop, a stoppage with it. Because if you remember correctly, I think um, it was last year, just before, about six months before COVID came around that we signed our CBA, Mm -hmm. which is basically the first time we as players, I'm talking about not the union, but we as players, current players, have an opportunity to sit at the negotiation table. So if you look oh. at my career, your career, Sean Bartlett's career, all those players that came before us and that are currently playing now have never ever had an opportunity to sit at the negotiation table. So that was one of the first things that we tried to do when we came in is to get to the point where we can say to the league, look, this is how much members we have and now we can, you know, we can sit at the table because that was, that was always the issue. You don't have enough members. You need so much percent members for you to be able to sit at, at, at the BOG meeting or whatever NEC meeting it is going to be where you can say what the players want or what the players, you know, need. And... Obviously, for all those years that we played, we were never give, given that opportunity. So now that um, the current leadership, which is um, Tanda Shabalala, Tulakhanyo Hashubelo, and um, Calvin Taylor, they've obviously worked their asses off to get us to that point. And now, mm. now basically, the negotiation starts. We've, I think, I don't know if you were still playing that time, Johnny, but we did a survey a couple of years ago where we went to each and every club. PSL and NFD, and we gave the players the survey and they filled it in. And obviously, mm -hmm. one of the, the biggest questions on that survey is what they would want as a minimum wage, mm -hmm. be it either in the PSL or in the NFD, whatever league they were playing in. And the players filled, the players completed the survey. We 
we got the survey, obviously we did, we ran through it and it's, it's, it's amazing about how fair the players are also on the one hand, you know. Mm. They sort of knew exactly what what the minimum wage should be in the NFD wow. and, and in the PSL. <clears throat> and it's only because, if we must be honest, there's maybe a handful at every club, be it PSL, be it um, NFD, only a handful of players that are earning the amount of money that they should be earning as a professional player. We are mm. far, far behind in terms of paying the players the correct money. And people are always, especially the media and public, the players are earning so much money. They're wasting their money. They're doing this. Come on, tell you what. The players are not earning a lot of money. They're not at all. People are I'm talking sure. about 4 million rand contracts and 4 million rand a year, 5 million. That's not true. There's an agent sitting there and he knows. It's not true. Yeah. If you, if, you, if you put this entire package together, it might come to 3.5 million a year. And of that money, probably 40, 50% of it is being taxed. So that is the issue that we're coming up with. We're coming up, why must, why must sports people, why must um, footballers pay the same tax as a CEO? Whereas the yeah. CEO's job is 30 years Absolutely. and a professional footballer's job, Johnny, is not 9, 12 years, it's actually 8 years. The average oh. for a footballer nowadays is 8 years. Oh. So you only oh. get your professional contract when you're 23, 24 the next thing you know, you're 13, 32, and nobody wants you anymore. Mm -hmm. so that's the reality. Great. Absolutely. So, so we need to pay our players a lot more money. A lot, lot more. I, I agree 100% of that. Um, it works two, twofold, is that we've got two problems. Is Obviously, there's a minimum wage. I'll, I'll Guys, I've got on my sleeve, and I'll, I'll tell you how it is. We had a youngster um, at Wits, and you saw that whole mess. So the sale, you know, and it was on an academy contract. Right, um, and yeah, it's, it's incentivized. The more games you play, obviously, it will, it will push up. But I'm of the understanding that once you become a full time pro and you've played three, four, five games, there's a, a minimum wage that must kick in because you're playing games, you're not just sitting in the stands, right? Anyway, the club gets sold. Um, I guess it's the new owners, but I get a move abroad for this kid, and these guys start asking for silly money. So, how does that balance up? You know, obviously, we had to threaten them, go legal, and eventually got the boy out at, at a big cost to us, obviously. However, if we or the players union is not there to fight for that player, who's on, let's call it, three and a half a month as a youngster, you know, it doesn't end up getting that opportunity that might not come again, you know. Mm. And that's really, it's really not fair. The tax isn't fair. Um, and then on the flip side also, yeah, there's, there's silly salaries quoted in the PSL, in the media, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, but there's only a handful. Let's be honest, there's only yeah. a handful of players that's on that sort of money. Mm. Uh, I would say the average of a sort, sort of good players around 2, 2.5 bar. And that's mm. gross. And that's mm. a total cost to company. Or mm. X, yeah. So, so, like, something has to be done about it. If you want to throw in a minimum wage... Or even for me, to be honest with you, for sustainability from a club point of view and looking at what income they get, you know, because a lot of these clubs are run like spaza shops, let's be honest. Uh, come a certain time, they can't play, pay players on time and that's also not fair. Then mm. we must look at introducing a system like in the MLS, you know, where there's maybe Sally Caps or, you know, some, some sort of tiered system that's going to work for those at the bottom and those at the top and keep the league sort of competitive. That's that's my view. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that's why it's... Uh, did you want to say something, Brent? Yeah, I just want to say, um, Keegan is 100% is, is correct, you know. Um, but I think when it comes to the clubs, I don't think the clubs should be blamed. I think, yes, the clubs are paying the players, but um, we mustn't forget the PSL, the PSL is a franchise. So... The, the, the PSL, the chairman and the board, they run that business. So mm. they are the ones that should implement those things. And on top of that, all the club owners are part of that business. So yeah. when they go into the boardroom, they know exactly how much a player at another club is earning. You know, So that's mm. where the problem comes in. But if you're going to have people um, that are, inter or let me say, they, they're in between, they're not, they're not, for a club, they're not against the club. And they set down those rules. That is why mm. it's important for players to be part of the negotiation. You cannot 100%. have all these sponsors come in 
you know, like now the league is again changed, new sponsor, DSTV. I was saying this to one of the players. I said, if you go to all the other countries in the world, the top countries in the world, um, I think our our league gets televised the most. Yeah, we've got a we've got a twenty four hour seven twenty four seven channel that that promotes our league. Mm. But those players don't see any of that in terms of airtime, in terms of how much yeah. money how much money are they making on those players every time they come on the TV. Mm. I was at, right, yeah. yeah, I was at I was at Super Sport when we won the league three times, and that was one of my questions because the the the, 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 the chairman at the club or the owner at the time said said to us. I would have rather preferred if Pirates or Chiefs win the league so I can sell more decoders. And that's the reality of it. The reality is that um, Supersport was making a lot of money selling decoders because football just came on the TV that time. You know, so for them, getting the... It's, it's, it's the truth. When, when, when Just before the 2010 World Cup, how many, how many people started buying satellite dishes and decoders? Maybe half of our country. So... You know, the money they made, the players are not seeing any of it. Any of it. So, you know, yeah. and, that's where, and that's why it's difficult for us as, as, as players to get in there. Because there's a lot of money going around. And, and obviously the players who are the, supposed to be the most important part of the, the engine or the tool is not getting what they deserve. For sure. But that's, that's the problem, Brent, is that I, I'm not talking from club level. I'm talking from all the way there. You know, on yeah. top, and until you get like, like you say, ex pros and stuff. You know, not only ex pros as maybe struggling today, but even on the other end of it, you know, people that understand maybe even ex pros has played all over the world that sees the different structures. Until you get them involved and you take them as serious stakeholders of the game, you're not going to progress or get the change. For example, yeah. you know, but you're hundred percent right. I mean, it's not must, going to get Sorry, Johnny, man. I must also congratulate them because look, um, the PSL in terms of where it's where it's come from and where it is now, it's Chivas. You know, you take That's the hat off to to Ivan and 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 Kaiser and all of that. The type of sponsorship that they attract for the PSL is huge. That's but huge. all I'm saying is, let's cut let's cut that cake equally and let's give it to the people that are the most important people. Let's make them yeah. the stars that everybody thinks they are. You know. Let right. them feel like they're doing a job, you know. So that's we just want we we just wanted to be fair. <laughs> yeah, but that's, you're right, though, because how many times, Brent? Let's say you, for example, how many times have you driven past a, a bus stop and your picture is on that bus stop with uh, Super Sport and stuff? What did you get out of it? That, that's just the reality of it. When it's Europe, I got my contract. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is it's, the best. It's not right. I don't have to ask any questions. You guys can just go to the book. I love it. I, I, was on the I was on the billboard in town, I think 2020, maybe um, 2008. I can't remember. Like a huge building, man. And <laughs> a huge, huge. Me and, me and Bacadese, Bacadese was tackling me. And um, I'm not sure if you know that defender from Zimbabwe. And all I wanted to do was just drive there and see the billboard. That's what I wanted to do. <laughs> It made me realize something that we as players, yeah, I, I think I literally drove there one night to see the billboard. But what did I get from it? We as players, I think, need to sort of develop this, um, you know, like you say, oh, I'm playing for the love of the game. I'm playing for the love of the game. But after you're done with the career, then the game, the game doesn't love you anymore. You don't have those things. So is it time to yeah. why do we change the narrative? Do players need to be more involved in... The off the off the field business, I know that's exactly what um, Keegan does. That's exactly what you guys do. But more empowered players, I believe, um, you'll have a better team. You'll have a better league if, if if players are more empowered. If players feel more valued. If players feel more secure, you're going to have a better league. So, what what is the solution? Um, is my question. Yeah, it's you gotta have a voice. But how do you have a collective voice? And, and it's like Brent said, is that despite all the pitfalls, these guys have grown the brand so mm. phenomenally, you know. But I guess, like, without sounding funny, there's going to have to be a change of card at some stage, you know. And it's it's a lot closer than what it was five, ten years ago. And I think that's probably the the best time to get in, 
you know, in time to change certain things like that. That's my view. Because, I mean, if you're going to roll up at the PSL and think you're just going to change things uh, overnight, it's not going to be easy. I mean, the same goes for the whole U.S. ex-players, retirement funds, look at what they do in Belgium and all of that stuff, you know, as part of your salary for your 8, 10 years career or whatever, you know. We don't have anything like that. So it's a difficult one to answer for me. I, I think it's a I think we one. are. I think we are. Dis- we are most disappointed. I don't think I had the knowledge or the know-how. It's easy to speak about it now, but when you're in that atmosphere, when you're in the club, and you have to stand together, it's not easy to stand together because you're easily separated by by um, being in the first eleven. Or you're easily separated by salaries, or you're easily separated by bonus. So it's like I think this happens a lot in third world countries. It's easy to create a a division, you know division yeah. where people don't stand together. <coughs> and when people stand together, I think that's when change really can happen. Yeah, it's difficult because I mean you have to go back and look cultural, you know, and and it's a job. People's feeding their families, you know. Are they easily gonna go risk that? Because they're the breadwinners, if you know what I mean. It's, mm. it's something like that also. It's, Absolutely. Oh, it's, yeah. it's delicate. It's, it's mm. difficult. Yeah, yeah I think we'll um, Johnny, Johnny said that um, I think going forward, definitely we need, to, we need to empower. We need to empower the players. I think especially us former guys who've been through all of that, Johnny, we need to, we need to be that voice in the current places, heads and minds to, to convince them. Because I was chatting to somebody another day, one, um, some, one of my colleagues at the, at the union, and I said to him, look, but for me, it feels like this generation of players are going to be the generation of players that are going to change, change it. If you look at what happened at Celtic last season, what's currently happening at TTM and all of that, the players are starting to stand up and, and, and they're starting to wow. voice their concerns. Mm. which is something that I've been crying for even when I was a player. I used to get upset with players when they don't talk, when they don't talk mm. up, you know. And you're right in saying that you've got a lot of youngsters in the team that are not playing maybe. They're not going to talk. They're not going to say, I'm not happy with what the money I'm getting. I'm not happy with this. I'm not, they're not going to do that because they just want to play. Mm. And you'll get senior players that will get vilified and that will get pointed out of saying the right things, but because he's a senior player, he's earning more money than those younger players, he's easier to let go of, regardless of how good he is. That yeah. is what a lot of players, that's what a lot of clubs and a lot of players are dealing with nowadays. Whereas if, if he says something and the owner of the club or the coach of the club doesn't like it, they try and find some way to get that player out. Yeah. Yeah. And, th- and that, is, that is where I have to do a lot of work, unnecessary work, sorry, unnecessary work. Because Welcome now... To the club. Yes, now I have to go and go to a club DC with a player and they, mm. they're trying to tell me that they're going to fire the player for poor performance. Mm. When everybody knows, FIFA has said that over and over and over again, FIFA has, has said it, that you cannot fire a player on poor performance. Because that makes no sense. how are you going to prove it? You know, how are you, you going to prove? Yes. Unless the guy scored a hat-trick of own goals and he showed you his middle finger, then, yes, then it's understandable, but no player goes out to yeah. training or games to play badly. Yeah. Yes. You know? So, <laughs> yeah, so they, like, that is why the, the CBA, we started with it, because it's a very important piece of the puzzle. Things yeah. like that can then be sorted out and be, you know, there yeah. is, there mm-hmm. is in, the, in the NSL handbook, there is ways of terminating players' contracts and employ yeah. them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I've read it so many times. Three months. Clubs have tried to change it so many times, but it doesn't work. Yeah. And that is why I'm saying the players are, are, are getting empowered. They are getting educated. We weren't, Johnny. You know that. We used to see the players' union once every three years, in Cape Town yeah. especially, because yeah. it was only up in Johannesburg. Yeah. And, and we know that certain intermediaries, agents, they try and help their players and give them what, some of the services that we're also giving them. Mm. But what we say to them is, do that. It's good. Mm. Those people are trying to help you. Other agents, you get some agents that work with a club. And the minute that club wants to fire their players, they will allow the club to fire the players so that they can have more business in the future. 
Mm. So we also empower players in that way. We say you must pick your agent or your business manager correctly because you can't have somebody who's more worried about his business and not yours. Mm. You know? Because mm. he's, he's actually, he's the one that's supposed to find you a club, is supposed to get you a good deal. Mm. The contracts, the contracts of players, um, I, I think um, maybe um, Keegan will help me, but my experience, players do not read contracts. They don't even ask for a copy of a contract. Yeah. They just mm. go on and say, thank you very much. I've signed. I can't wait to play. And bye-bye. Mm. They don't read it. Yeah. They don't ask for another copy. And it's sad. Because that mm. is the first thing we tell them. We have to empower you. I mean, educate you about your contract, your employment contract. Because Keegan will know the employment contract of any player playing in the NFD or in the PSL is exactly the same. Unless the heading, the first page and the two last pages will be the The rest yeah, of the contract yeah. is all the same for each and every yeah. player in the league. But yeah. they don't read it. Mm. You know? And, so, and is that an important um, role that you play as an intermediary? Yeah, it's very, in that gap? Very, very, very important because obviously we don't get the boys to sign without us. Look, there's various processes in the deal. It's obviously initial interest. Um, then we start, when we start chatting financial, I don't make the final decision. It's up to the player. But I will always give my opinion based on where the player is, whether he's a youngster, whether he, wherever he's coming. You know? And I'll, I'll always be fair. Not to be fair to the club, but you look at sort of that that planning, that mapping of the career. You know, Is it a three-year contract? What age is he? Do well yeah. after two years, you're getting a renewal kind of thing. Um, but it's important, you know. So, so my job is to, once I've spoken to the the let's say the the important things to make him understand the terms because some of the clubs will change you know it's the annex and it's the oh. first page that's that's obviously sure. different but um it's, it's important for us to make sure that they understand and brent is 100 percent correct they never walk away with their copies but that's what i do i'll always have my electronic <laughs> copy i'll always have my hard copy because i know tomorrow it's going to be needed you know i'll go back to I'm friends with Sundowns again, but I'll go back to the Keegan Dolly thing all those years ago. Um, at the at the DRC, I still don't know how we lost. But had I not had a copy of the contract, I would not have been able to pick up the fundamental differences, um, you know. Um, so it's very very important. Yeah. And if players aren't going to do it, we've mm -hmm. got to do it because ultimately, who they going to come to when when there's issues? You know, they're going to come to us. Or they're going to come to the union. Um, and we can't help them. Because if you sign Honest, something already. No, no. Honestly, we, we can help them. But in all honesty, I will turn them away because I will tell them, you need a copy of your contract. How am I going to find evidence or explain what you're trying to say if I don't have it in front of me? But a, yeah. tip, a, tip, a tip for those players, take your cell phone out. Yeah, you're yeah, on yeah. your phone Simple. all day, every day. Quiet. Just take your Quiet. phone and take a picture of every page you sign. Finish. Why? Why? And and be brave enough to do it because you you'll be stuck in that contract for the next three years. So rather pluck up the energy and the the bravery to do it in that moment than sit to yeah. sit through the next three years. And unfortunately, that's what some of our players, that's what some of us are willing to do. We just don't have the courage to 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 stand up and say, okay, I'm going to take it now. And we'll sit out there three years. Any advice that you have, Keegan, for players? <laughs> but, 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 Johnny, exactly just that. There, you know, if I can't accompany a player, like especially now with COVID, okay, it's a bit different because after all these years, the relationship with the clubs um, uh, not been screwed over in that sense. But always player, we go through it because I always get the draft copy. When that player is sitting in front of that uh, contract that he's about, I literally pick up the phone, you know, and I make him send me even after he signed it so that we know, you know, the club is going to send me my copy, but so we know there's no funny business going on. Um, so, yeah, it's, 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 it's about, it's about like you guys saying, it's about being wise and always players, not being like, you know, gullible and trusting and because mm. football and trust is. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you yeah. ask me any advice? 
I think what Brent um, says, um, and that encouraging to hear that this generation might be the generation that's going to change it. But I think just moving off that topic a bit, Keegan, what type of um, Charlton's asking, what type of services do you offer? Because he came late. And Nigel asked, what type okay. of player must you be to be scouted by an agent like yourself? Services, in a nutshell, obviously, you scout the player. It's about career planning, you know, it's about. You're either good enough for Europe or you're not. I mean, we know we've got an extensive network in Europe, you know, and that's that's where we're going. And I'll, that's my next answering my next question. I'll do next. It's, it's about helping off the field, you know, for post career. It's about your investments. Again, we can't force players to do things. I mean, out of our forty, you know, we can't force all of them. But you've got to be there to give that to provide that advice at the different stages of their career, because sometimes. But eventually they're going to come and say, listen, I actually need to, you know, and you need to be on a sort of advice um, or have your panel of people that you can use for tax, for investments, for your banking, you know. Um, and then obviously also just about, um, yeah, the, the biggest thing is for me is the communication is, is off the field, what's happening, uh, caring about people. I think. Yeah point that, of view because you must brilliant. remember you're managing people that is brilliant and i think it goes both ways one of my regrets was that i didn't i wasn't as strong as brent was um playing when i was playing i don't think i had his strength and that was one of my regrets that i didn't openly communicate with my agent so i would do some one one thing i remember i did behind his back because i needed something but I was too afraid to go ask him. And you, Brent, said, la. But I mean, <laughs> that's the short form of it. It's a cultural thing. I was brought up, I, I was brought up, um, I think I know Brent's daddy was a strong guy, but I was brought up um, in a home where it was very, you don't, oh, it's a Ferrari. You don't ask. You just, you know, you're submissive. Mm. You don't ask for that. You accept. I mean, brilliant parents, but that was the environment that I grew up in because that's the environment they grew up in. So it's a it's a total change of mindset that I think I've developed it now through the grace of God. But I think it's a totally different mindset that you have to develop, the strength that you have. Brent, a question. Why do Cape Town players, and this is probably for you, Keegan, as well, you can answer. Why does Cape Town players get paid less than players in Joburg or Durban? I have a something to say, but I'm going to get you guys say first. I think, I think, yeah, <laughs> I think, um, in all honesty, in all honesty, Johannesburg teams or even to a certain extent, Durban teams, they they invest more in their, in their clubs, man. It's simple. They, they're willing to pay their players more and that is why our best players end up playing there. The clubs in Cape Town, it's just, that's it. They don't, they're not willing to pay the same amount of money that the boys are getting in Joburg and Durban. Enough. I think I think also I can only obviously speak from our experiences and you have to without mentioning club names the big boys in Joburg obviously we know the sponsorship is a lot different so there's there's more in the coffers for example right um, in Cape Town I think it's also they've got this thing of thinking it's almost developing a player you know is the next sort of platform and you're right that, that they don't generally want to invest but from my from my side I mean I have had instances where I've gotten players like, you know, sort of above fair wages, you would say. So if you look at a gift links, for example, yeah, I came to and I bought him from Egypt, but he got sort of an above wage. And it's also, I guess, because you could easily have gone to a bit or a sundowns at the time. So if you want to be competitive when the clubs decide and you see the long-term vision that maybe this is a player with a sell-on value, you will invest, but they obviously don't do it <laughs> enough, you know. Yeah. Um, mm. But you, you, I think you, yeah, you're right. Yeah, and I think I think um, this question came up a week ago, I think, and I didn't have the answer for it. But afterwards, when I went back, I thought about it. Ninety percent of South Africa's wealth is in Cape Town. So 90% of South Africa's wealth, um, the people that own 90% of South Africa's wealth live in Cape Town. So the wealth is in Cape Town, but I think what you guys are saying now, 
it's it's the model the model is to develop and like it's like to 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 send away and i mean you can't i mean that's how a businessman wants to choose to do it but then you also have to accept that it, people are always going to be leaving people's always going to be players always going to be leaving and looking for something better yeah. i think that's a very good point reality for cape town players um that are maybe too comfortable with staying in cape towns that also know that there's a lot of things out there i mean brains a great example about that for sure yeah cape town. Is there any... hmm? go 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 no 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 go ahead johnny no no i didn't have anything i was hoping you did <laughs> no yeah. no just in I... terms of the of, of cape town the um yes cape town is known for developing good players but there has to come a point where we want to start challenging one of the cape town teams is to start challenging to win the league or do something the last time that was done was with ix when i was playing and that was also a young team luckily for them they had a good coach and he knew how to to get that team you know but in terms of the last time santos why because they had an experienced team did they get paid well i don't think so but they had experienced players you know that were serial winners as well the players we developing currently in cape town are not, are not serial winners you know they might be great talented players but in terms of them in a group in a team like say cape town spurs those boys have been together for quite a, quite a long time so i don't think that there's an excuse that they can't play together you know mm. so mm. that is the questions or difficult questions the supporters or whoever needs to ask the clubs because you can't be developing for 50 years or 15 years there must come a point where yeah. your development is done and now you're going to test yourself you know what i mean yeah 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 you need that balance i think man i think that's where they're getting it wrong is is that as i brand is saying about the investment right so you, it's almost like if you're going to invest in your team and you invest in the spine of your team a sort of experience so you know you have to pay more than what you would want to pay you know and then around them you can develop and you can be competitive so you can still like nurture your talent on one side but you can try and remain competitive so you've got that sort yeah. of sporting balance and the balance in the scenes of the club as a well, whole yeah. you know yeah. but you, you've you've got to be willing to otherwise you're going to just top finish top 8 you're going to be happy with you know and if you don't ah, it's not the end of the world is next year yeah and i mean yeah, but that's yeah. also sorry johnny but that's no, also no. i saw the one guy's thing now about investments and and sponsors um the reason why cape town clubs are not attracting investors or sponsors is because they're not playing on tv out of our six mm. teams only two of two of them are playing on tv the one club doesn't need sponsors it doesn't need investors <laughs> and the other club is probably trying to get whoever they can on board because that's how the club the club needs any club needs extra funds you know mm. it's basically a tap that's open and and it keeps on mm. running so you have to you mm. have to try and plug every hole or whatever you can get mm. but clubs in cape town in general even before 10 years ago they were they struggled to invest they struggled to attract investors and sponsors because i don't know why i, I seriously don't know why is there not enough but trying to but maybe maybe if we become serial sort of winners, winners you know you compete yes. the things there, there's a big difference because if me i'm an investor you want to be associated with a competitive brand not just a exactly. cool funky brand you want a competitive winning brand because ultimately that's going to get you more screen time more this yeah. more that. you know what i mean it's yeah you want to be associated with that the brand and, big brand and, mm. and you can't you can't forget that cape town yes it's a rugby um it's a big rugby as a big rugby support but it has a big soccer f- a football base as well so now we're going into a different field where well, you know I think, I think that, There's a tap but there's only a certain amount of water and where is it being directed to yeah. so it would take somebody with with with, with balls to say okay I'm going to create a serial winning team and once yeah. they become so competitive yeah. you sort of have to hope that those investors come in but I mean it's a gamble yeah, but our people also are, are the people in the western cape to be honest with you Johnny they they support english football more than they support local football wow 
Look, that's Both their choice. That's yep. their choice. But if if you're gonna do that, then don't ridicule our local clubs because you're not mm. supporting them. If you mm. were supporting them, buy a jersey, mm. go watch mm. one game a season, 100%. then at least you're helping them. You know, yeah. you're putting some money. Yeah. You're putting some money in the account, and then you can yeah. have a say. And then you can say, you guys yeah. are wasting my money. That is yeah. why Chiefs, Pirates, those teams they attract all the sponsors. All the corporate sponsors want to go to them. Why? It's because they have a following. They have people exactly. that are interested mm. in them. You know? Yeah. Our Cape Town teams, jeez. Uh, I don't know when last I saw a, Cape, uh, a stadium in Cape Town full. Back, a full yeah. Match. yeah. You know? But, 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 but if Man City or Man United come, then the stadium yeah. is, oh, is overbooked. Full. You know? Full, uh, yeah. but I, I, you know, with late last year when I was completing my postgrad in football business, uh, one of my sort of thesis was on. I'm not going to say the club, but one of the bigger boys then in Joburg. And if you break it down, obviously there's a big history there, right? And that's where also a lot of the following comes in. But ultimately, I think it's success, man. I think it's also when you win, you you know you you're going to want to go to the stadium also because you know. Um, you're going to go and watch not only entertaining football, but you're going to watch a winning team, per se. And I think that yeah. all sort of plays hand in hand. From the club's point of view, it's like, okay, what sort of offering can I offer to entice supporters to come? So, if, for example, you look at the, they want to get this smaller stadium and all of that. I'm sure probably they're thinking of like how they can market that once that's up and running, how they can throw people in. But then they're gonna have to be competitive so that once they're winning and they're throwing a crowd, then I'm sure you're gonna maybe compete more with the sponsors and the investors and stuff like that. Yeah. I think it's a Next part of everything, sort of thing. Kwai, yeah. I think um, maybe to end it off, um, the thing we were talking about, the catchphrases become serial winners. Guys, I definitely want to have you back. I think we talked um, about so 30 minutes, 30 to 5 minutes on one topic, but you have to unpack these things. So. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't ask you guys um, no, a few fine. questions that I wanted, but I definitely want you guys back. It was um, no so, so insightful. Um, on the show also, I'm figuring my way around this. We like to support local business. And um, yeah, so has it come on? Okay. So there, there uh, even Steve, yeah, and Beauty. Um, please support Westgate Mall. They, they're in Westgate Mall and in Promenade. They're in Zervenbach Mall. They're in Kenwood Centre. So they're a franchise. Wow. That's really quiet. Um, yeah. So I think we... There is one more question. I don't know, Brent. I don't know if you want to take it. It's, hey, guys. Is that the same reason why Bufana plays here once a decade? In Cape Town. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yes, probably. Look, <laughs> we can we can that's, say what I know. A lot of yeah, but I know a lot of people say, and I'm one of those people that say um, politics and sport shouldn't mix. But unfortunately, they they, they do. Mm. And yeah, and especially when we're talking about investment sponsorship, when we're talking about people with the big money. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Unfortunately, our 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 <laughs> province is run by the DA, as everybody knows. And if you look. Just compare us to Durban, and then you'll see the yeah. difference. You understand? Mm. Yeah. Why do they always get all the major events, especially football events? But if it's a rugby event, we know where it's going. You understand? So yeah. that's just that's just basically what it is. Um, the Western Cape is for rugby, and um, Johannesburg mm. and Durban and the other provinces are for football and all the other sports. Okay. So I think yeah. model of the lesson is, or model of the story, <laughs> have rugby players, guys. You're <laughs> well, gonna play. You're gonna get played Cape Town Stadium now. So <laughs> exactly, they're taking over a football stadium. They're just telling you, what are we doing? What are we doing as football people? We're allowing rugby to take over a stadium that was built specifically for the World Cup for football. Yeah, I get it. If we achieve, yeah, if we achieve the Pirates uh, part of, as part of the Western Cape, that wouldn't have happened. No. Why isn't no, it, uh, the shop, I no mean, uh, Why isn't the Lions playing at FNB? Yeah, exactly. Listen, exactly. Brent Carroll from the Players Union. Thank you very much, pro <laughs> footballers, current footballers. Please, um, 
get in touch with him. He was very helpful. Keegan Wasserfall from the the Abuma Sports Group. Um, great agent. Please get in touch with him. Um, and we will definitely, we will definitely, definitely have you guys back. Thank you very much for your time, Thank guys. You. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks John. John. Thanks, Brent. Okay. Thanks, Keegan. Thanks, John. Cheers. Okay. Yeah, bye. Cheers.